fund. This is on view through August 12th, so we invite you to come back again. Um, I'm delighted to be presenting. This is a very exciting conversation uh, between poet Claudia Rankin and Mel Chin, presented in conjunction. is the author of five collections of poetry, including Citizen, An American Lyric, and Don't Let Me Be Lonely, two plays including Provenance of Beauty, a South Bronx travelogue, numerous video collaborations, and is the editor of several anthologies, including The Racial Imaginary, Writers on Race in the Life of the Mind. Um, for Citizen, Claudia won um, won the Forward Prize for Poetry, the National Book Critics Circle Award for Poetry, um, the Los, Ange Los Angeles Times Book Award, the Penn Open Book Award, and the NAACP Image Award. Um, Rankin is a recipient of the Bobbitt National Prize for Poetry, Poets and Writers Jackson Poetry Prize, and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Lenon Foundation, the Mark Arthur Foundation, United States Artists, and the National Endowment. Um, she is a chancellor of the Ameri Academy of American Poets and teaches at Yale University as the Frederick Eisman Professor of Poetry. Um, and to her right, um, working across multiple mediums for the past 40 years, Houston-born, North Carolina-based conceptual artist Mel Chin, whose work surrounds you, um, uses his art to incite public discourse around social causes that matter to him. Uh, Chin is known for works that require multidisciplinary collaborative teamwork, and pieces that can join cross-cultural aesthetics with complex ideas and social calls to action. His work has been widely exhibited nationally, definitely internationally, <laughs> definitely Queens, but let's just get right into it, shall we? Um, yeah. We will, so I guess we're going to do maybe 40 minutes and then take questions. Absolutely. So Claudia has developed questions to start off the conversation. And what we're going to do probably is start with after each kind of conversation. Um, part part of it, we'll take some questions. That sounds great. Yeah. I'm here to help. Okay. Thank you. I like that. Good. Oh, wow. This is on. This is on. <laughs> um, good afternoon. It's such a pleasure to be here. Uh, Mel and I go way back. He, he has the honor of having one of the first dances with my daughter at, what was it, like three, four years old. <laughs> so um, it's very exciting for me to be able to be in conversation with Mel today. I, 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 what I did was I, I was thinking about Mel's work and, and, I, and if you go to his website, he has these categories. It's, it says themes, and then it's like political. One of them is on dreams. And so I thought, oh, I'll make my own categories. And so my categories are water, dirt, translation, sports, definitions, no furniture, and portraiture. So we're gonna start with water. We're gonna talk a little bit about my ideas as it relates to um, Mel's work, and Mel will talk even more about his, his work. And, um, and then we'll open it up to you for your water questions. And then we'll move on to dirt. We got it? We got it. All right, cool. All right, so why start with water? Because the human body is 50 to 75% water, right? Blood. I wrote this down. Blood is 92% water, that makes sense. Um, our brain and muscle, 75% water. And bones, 22% water. So when you leave here, some of you might have already done this. When you leave here and you go to Times Square, um, Mel just installed um, what Mason Slomer calls a nautical traffic jam. The piece, there are two pieces, Wake and Unmoored, but Unmoored is described as a conversation with climate change. And so I wanted us to just start with Mel talking about the piece, what was behind both Wake and Unmoored, and then I will have a, a, a 1B question to go with that. I covered some of it before, but you know, 
it, um, of course, we say it this way, uh, the two pieces of wagon and more uh, don't have much water in them. <laughs> and, uh, well, it has wood. So it, I has, think tw it has metal Yeah. Where, where are those boats going to exist? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and, and so maybe it's about, um, and since we're so much made of water, it's about, I feel, two pieces is about a relationship with ourselves and, and history. And, and that's essentially uh, where water fits in. And uh, to think about how it might inundate us and how it floods our own imagination with maybe other associations. So it's not quite. It is quite. <laughs> the, um, the reason, the reason um, this and then the work, I don't know, did you make it into the, um, the room, the Flint water room? The, with the raincoats and swimsuits. Um, I, I think I can show you the on here. Oh, I don't know how this works. Yeah. Oh, I did it, I did it, so there it is. Um, the Flint water crisis began in 2014, as you know, but issues of access to clean drinking water as old as humankind. In 2005, Peter Brackford but not a former chairman and CEO of Nestle called the idea that water is a human right extreme. It takes 6.3 gallons of water to make 17 ounces of plastic. It takes 39 um, gallons of water to manufacture a new car. Carbon emissions are altering the chemistry of seawater. Um, and, and with global warming, even 1% increase in the temperature of water, seawater, um, is causing the fluctuations in the weather. Um, so I wanted, this is what I wanted to ask, Mel. You've done a lot of work about water. When did your thinking about water and accessibility to clean water begin? Water as a human right, water as a carrier ecosystem. What are your aesthetic considerations of water and how do they inform your politics and the right to clean drinking water? Well, the first, when you first asked that, I think uh, I always deny things. No, I, I'm not, but I guess I am now, you know, because it has been part of my whole way of being and thinking. And uh, it comes even when you go down to your, 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 your roots and make a correlation. Uh, you think about what most attracted me about even Asian thought when I was revisiting it. You're not taught a lot of that in Texas. They don't talk a lot about Taoism or anything else. Mm -hmm. But it's like in your cultural roots and how it, uh, the most uh, fluid, the most uh, representation is the idea of war. And, but sometimes it's like being moved by documentation or reportage. You know, Robert. Kaplan, uh, in the 90s, wrote uh, an article called The Coming of Anarchy. And the Coming of Anarchy talked about water and its relationship to global politics and war, basically war. And it traces the, the lack of the changes in Africa unto our own prairies. And it was really, it really moved me tremendously to consider what it was all about. And then by the time you start seeing how Enron was all beginning with its pipeline systems, uh, move into wanting before its collapse, the concrete uh, uh, privatizing of water, and how many people involved in the world of commerce and finance were thinking, this is what we want to own, and remove that right, you become very animated <coughs> in thinking about what its association is. Mm -hmm. And what about this piece? What, um did you go in thinking, okay, we're gonna make these swimsuits and raincoats initially, or did you evolve to that moment? It, it, it evolved. You know, uh, the, the first conception of maybe uh, fashion and plastic bottles was for a project that was, reje was soundly, re was rejected for, uh, in Italy, for this thing about fashion. And I realized that was not the right place for it. But when I arrived in Flint uh, with the Funder Project, because uh, anything, 
you know, we've been working on the Thunder Project for so many years, and you get tired, and you get beaten down by things, and the lack of finances or resources, and then you say, I can't do this anymore, and then Flint happens, and you get up and you're compelled to, I must do this, because uh, it, the assault of yourself not to do it would be just too much. So we went to Flint with that, and how to occur. Were you invited? No, I don't, no. no we go in, and it was <laughs> and, you know, we were invited. And it's pretty interesting, this is really interesting. We go in, and how Flint fits starts, it's one of those, hey, by the way, it's by the way. Then we constructed a situation where we gathered after the project was introduced to the mayor's office, different citizens. We went back after it was all conceived and connections were made, and we went to have a meeting with 20 different citizen groups that gathered to hear me out. I think mostly, were, were these groups mostly um, African American groups? No, they're mixed. No? They're, they're mixed. mixed. They're, they're mixed. And um, it was like a serious situation because it was like, it starts off like, okay, how are you going to use this now? Hillary's been here, Trump's been here, and Janae Monell's been here, and all the, the hip hop stars, and all the movie stars, they all, and we still don't have any drinking water. So how do you, an artist, is gonna do any damn thing? And how are you gonna make yourself aggrandized and walk away while we still don't have drinking water? And so it was like, in my face. So I, I Next thought, time you have to go earlier. <laughs> no, it was the right thing to do, because I said, you know, Actually, uh, I don't want to use you. I actually want to pay you for those empty bottles. And if you can collect them, I'll pay you for them. And then I will not only pay you for them, we'll take them down to the North Carolina and turn it into fabric, and we'll contact Tracy and make great words for her, and we'll bring it right back for you to sew. And then we'll have a fashion show. And then we'll come back again after that, which we'll be back in September to figure out how to make it Flint fit your brand. Well, this is the first time, but if you say no, and that's the way you're working in the field. If you're with people, it's depending on their opinion about things. I said, by the way, after I orchestrated all these connections, it took about six, seven months, you know? But if you say no, I walk away. It's done. And it was the first time that they, they had some, we had some back and forth. I think it was the first time they all agreed with each other. Wow. And we, so it was incredible. That was an incredible moment, because I was like ready to say, if you don't want it, you don't need me. You have enough. That's great. That, so th this idea, I like that the actual body, the, the um, bottles, the garbage of became a kind of living sculpture that moved itself back into the economy. So you created a sort of cyclical um, cycle. Well, we're in, we're in the process, because I think that um, there's just a limit to what art shows can do, you know, and the expectations should not, I think you have to project beyond and say, okay, after this, we gotta do this now, we have to create the business model, it's not me, but, get some of those uh, Yaleys or those Harvard types to come up with a proper business model. Or maybe the University of Michigan that they're visiting there to degree where something can be sustained, you know, to, to also come back to the next phase and ask again, do you want us to try this? You know, and I think we're, we're going to go back. We're going to have a Glenn Fit part two in Glenn. So that's the end of our water any questions before we move on? There's a question there. Do we have, do we have that? Oh, you didn't have oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, So I think today, especially in the global north, we kind of don't really have, can you hear? a relationship with water, like we kind of don't even think about it very much. How do you think, like this is specifically for Melchin, like how do you think your work kind of influences the way we should 
change our relationship with water and how we should think about it. You know, I don't make art to uh, actually try to influence that. I, I think uh, you have to, I start with how I have, I make work to try to change myself. I think you have to start there, that the work should be compelling enough to say, make me reconsider all my ignorance or my delusions about a particular topic. And that's the, how, the way I work. And I, I'm hoping that through that process, it, it informs that, as I always like to say what art is about, it's a catalytic structure for, for to stimulate uh, maybe something you could do. You know, I don't know. You know. Um. Also, one of the reasons we started with the idea of the body being 50 to 75 percent water is that it is you. It is you, and so you have to show up in a certain way. And I do think you have a relationship to water. I mean, Hurricane Sandy was here; it affected the landscape drastically. Um, um, global warming will change our relationship to, to weather, which is, in a sense, a relationship to water. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Uh, you know, when I was approaching back. This is a little bit backwards, but uh, to the way uh, an unmoored project. Uh, my critique uh, was was what started that project around around devices that we use, the studies that uh, the digital devices that are, we use every day. Y'all have smartphones? They're kind of cool. I finally got one a couple of years ago. And uh, but what has happened is that the uh, it's a process over the couple of year, ten years that they've been shown to remove empathy, and maybe out of survival, I began to think, of, "Man, if empathy goes, then we're out of we're out of luck," you know. Donald and, Trump. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and then uh, I, but what phenomenon was argued, and like Hurricane Sandy, like a shooting in Florida, can break us out of that cycle, and because we have to associate beyond with that device can offer. So, so moving into augmented reality or moving into that digital stage was a process, a critical process to say, well, I think maybe we should try to put, as an artist, put phenomenon in the device. You know, so that's, that's a direct or directive. Hi, I just had a quick question around, um, the, the piece we were shown. Um, how did you address kind of like the like class politics of the piece? I'm just like, I think I, if I remember correctly, Flint is a working class community. So like how do you try to subvert the class politics within that by like having people collect the plastic bottles and then you creating the art through like that. So you get recognized through the art. Well, uh, I don't know. The whole idea of maybe it's like re project is about reanimating the whole thing. Mean, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's not just been devastated by the criminal poisoning of the citizens, the plant, and the kids of plant. It's also the criminal behavior I feel of the whole situation of capitalism that has abandoned the city that did the most for so long. So there's a whole world of manufacturing and all these things that have occurred where people don't have jobs and they're living in situations so far with the highest water bills, by the way, in the country, and they have to deal with that. And so to come to that, it's not about, I don't try to put in too much thing of, okay, uh, this, this class consciousness or whatever, and because in the end, um, it, it's, everybody's more conscious about it than I am. They know it, and it's up for them to decide you know, uh, this collection part is only just like an experiment. And not to say, this is all you're going to be doing is collecting bottles. The end product is I'd like you to hold Flint pen. The end product is I'd like to wear that unisex raincoat, but a lot, a lot bigger than those sizes, by the way. And, and be in the rain in Michigan with a Flint pen raincoat, you know, that I bought. Because you made it. And you own it. And I don't want anything, you know, ownership of that. So my ownership of this idea uh, transforms is the beginning or the, the end of the artwork. And also I would add that the, um, the making of the work in Flint, one, that the paying for the bottles um, addresses immediately the economic impact 
of what it means to be asked to then go buy your own water because we're not going to supply you with any water. Um, if you want to be healthy, you know? And, and also, I think when you have, and this is a sort of different question, but it's the question about the impact of art on the viewer's historical memory. And so, to be able to say, well, water doesn't really connect with, you know, affect me here. I mean, here and there is one thing. We are one country. So that, what's going on in Flint, Michigan, is our problem, is our problem. And to be able to connect up, and if we have to move through Mel's work to get there, then we move through Mel's work to get there. Yes, we want one, two. I'll come right back to you. It's a simple question. When you say, we go in, is that the royal we, or is that a group of people that you're traveling with? It's with and Amanda. working with? It's with Amanda, who runs the, the Fundry project. We don't have too much of a staff. I mean, we're not very royal. <laughs> and sometimes, most people work for me, they know they're the boss of me because uh, it's no fault. I mean, we go in in terms of like, with the funder this week, because uh, we we're, we work to represent all the funders that are drawn, and we are subject to delivering that message, stop childhood living poison. The we is like a half a million people so far, so, and we have to represent. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm a biological oceanographer, so water is super important to me. And what I'd like to say is full of life, life that we're not familiar with because we are terrestrial. And life under the sea looks so different. It is beautiful. And with climate change, you are going to lose them, just like we lost beautiful hallucinogenia. I don't know what my point is. My point is that water is really important for life of all kinds, not just humans. Well, I would say just what the issue of lead is like, uh, uh, it's invisible, and how to make things visible. I think the projects related to water or the ocean, the oceanography, the projects that I'm interested in is making those invisible, invisible entities pronounced because uh, knowing plankton, what I've learned from you and, and all the books I've been looking at, skimming, that's a good word when you're working with water, <laughs> uh, uh, how it's responsible for 50% of life on Earth. And you've got to get your act together on this. So uh, the more you know, the more moved you are to, to one more thing, take a deep dive. And, you know, I, 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 as you were speaking, I was thinking about Naomi Klein and what she says about um, how countries like the United States and European countries um, would care a little bit more about tsunamis and things like that if they were happening here. That because they are hitting um, countries with less economic power than we have, we're able to kind of just put it aside right now. So, you know, there is a literal flooding that is happening. Um, but let's go to our second, our next um, category, which is dirt. Dirt. And um, I, I, I wrote, Mel, you have referred to yourself as a recovering conceptual artist. Would it be fair to say the recovering partly refers to working despite the injustice that you have encountered in various populations as part of your artistic process. I'm thinking here of New Orleans and Operation Pay Dirt. You went down there to confront the disregard of human life that allowed for the abandonment of a population of people after the failures of the levees and flood walls protecting the night fort, only to discover the levels of lead that was in the soil even before Katrina happened, so the devastation um, preceded 
what was in the news? Well, uh, when uh, Katrina hit, uh, I remember stopping by a good friend, you might know Rick, Rick Lowe, Project Row Houses, we just met in the sidewalk and he just said, you going? And yeah, he had already been there. And we went again. Yeah, so we went, we went because we just wanted help and to see if our practice could make a difference. Uh, after a bunch of interviews with, with people have, who had survived all that, and uh, it was, I was moved because I was, um, I felt for the first time in my life, and I'm, as a conceptual artist, thinking I'm pretty smarty pants. Uh, <laughs> I was inadequate and unworthy, and I was I was distinctly distraught, and uh, and I, you know they were trying to give me this doctorate, my honorary doctorate at RISD, and I was supposed to take a plane from New Orleans, and I said I can't go, I don't deserve this. I remember that. Thank goodness Helen and my wife pushed me on the plane. Said, you go do this, go do this, because it, I, I went and I realized I had to come back. I kept coming back, and I kept coming back to seek what I needed because I said the magnitude of what happened here needs something of equal magnitude to respond, and I wasn't prepared. And when I found out through a soil researcher that his maps represented not soil or dirt, but the blood of 50%, 30 to 50%, of the inner city childhood population of New Orleans points of the lead, the idea comes immediately. Because when they say there's no reconstruction money, very little hope for money for this and then it's all about the money. And I immediately thought, well, I can't raise that much money, but we can, we can, we can make that much money. And that was the idea, it's like, the, 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 the voices of the population most threatened, the young, needed to be represented as having value, as having value. And that was what was very easy to, uh, to conceive of, much harder to execute, but it began dedicated for that purpose. You talk about the wreckage of hope, that phrase is your phrase, and also the collective attitude that unauthorized collaboration how important that is to your process. Could you tell us a little bit about what you actually did in, in, when you went down? Well, um, well, what it did was uh, uh, we first did research on the neighborhoods uh, and found, to check that out, and found uh, extreme levels of lead, way far worse than I had ever imagined in different neighborhoods where the most, most of the violence occurs in New Orleans. Where there could be, um, you know, I think there's areas that were again worse than Baghdad in the city of New Orleans in terms of the amount of uh, citizens that are murdered, and then found that it is correlated to the maps of lead and soil, basically, because it's hard to pin down the blood levels. But it was a pretty heavy situation, and so yeah, you look at the record of hope that's not just uh, uh, sociological. It is a physiological situation that's on you, on top of poverty, on top of everything else. And so it was, it was an obligation and a, a being compelled to say, well, we have to do something that's really for real. And uh, you can't go to places that have been destroyed like this and give them bogus ideas. And so the, the, the commitment was to begin and start right there in the community, in St. Rock, and we did the Safe House Tour or an uh, actual house, and that house, it was run by this, this young woman trying to make art projects. But we were there because uh, we found out the lead and soil was so intense, and three kids had emerged out of that house, poisoned forever. And, and so you gotta go directly into the beast. And I remember the day that we, uh, we opened it up was not at the art opening day, but on the, uh, before, we had a Love Where You Live party sponsored only for the neighborhood. And so I was, had a bunch of kids gathered around and they say, what does it look like? They said, it looks like a ball, it looks like a bank. I said, now it's not done yet, I'm gonna open it up 
and I'm gonna crack this door, and you gotta be careful when you go in there, you know? So I cracked it open, and like these kids rushed in there screaming, where is the money? You know, and, and I said, it's gonna be your money. And we started. So, this, this moment, is this, a, I don't, I, I actually don't know this, is this a, um, a moment that led to um, all the work you then have done with lead? Was this the, 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 the originating project, or when did you do the Tiffany lamps and all of the other work? Well, actually, uh, the project, as far as my relationship with heavy metal, not the music, actually, you know, so some, some are pretty good, you know. Um, it was Revival Field. Okay. Revival Field in 89 was uh, uh, the whole kind of idea of plant pulling heavy metals right. and the sculpting of an environmental uh, situation. And uh, it got me in trouble and it didn't matter. We did it anyway, kind of situation. But I always was always aware that no plants in the, the, the history of plants uh, had ever picked up lead. It was something that was not possible with plants. And so it was always in my mind. And my knowledge of, of what it does to the human body was informed at the origins back then in the 90s, you know, with scientists. So. And then when did you do the Tiffany lens? But that just happened, you know. That's you, new. Yeah, because when you walk in that and you look at it and say, wow, check it out, you know, Tiffany. And, knowing that it's lead in glass and lead and thinking about the history and it's like the new stat new stat for curators which is which mm -hmm. is part of the really cool deal. They they said, okay, you can do something and I was like and I, I had to be honest with them. I said, you know, this lead stuff probably funny. And um, but it was important to make the work in the spirit of that. And uh, to that's called study lamp. After the Cincinnati left study. And the plant, when, when you worked with the scientists to find plants that would um, pull lead from the soil, where, was that in New Orleans as well? No, that was real early. The biofield, actually, because um, that was just like, uh, that emerged after my first museum shut, Hirshhorn, okay. in 89, where. I was in the elevator at that, I, have, I hear voices, don't you, you know, everybody really hears voices, right? Because, you know, come on. I know they're talking to you now, and we're talking to you, but it's competing, I understand. <laughs> but I have that voice that always is questioning. You can say, oh man, what do you love? I love doing this shit, I love making stuff, you know? and then the other voice says, well stop, stop now. And you, you agree to one or the other, and I agreed to stop. And I did not make work for a long time. And people thought I was going kind of nutty, and would say, "You got to start. You just had a show. You better sell or make work." And I did not. I refused. And I did this free research for like six months, and I found this hippie article in the Whole Earth Review. Terence McKenna, who was a psilocybin expert, uh, was talking about the Tura, you know, and it could clean soil. And I, I, I just said, oh my goodness. So I went around like uh, another film reference is The Graduate, you know, the, the, and not, not Miss, I wasn't Mrs. Robinson, nor was I the other character. I was the guy walking around saying, are you saying plastics? I was going to art opening talking about plants. And people said, oh man, you've lost it. But I was like moved by this possibility, but then, and this is educates it, your path toward New Orleans as well. If it's like, okay, if it's plants, which plant? And because, by the way, it won't be plants, it will be people that will be affected by your decisions. And, and so if it's gonna be about people, then you better be sure what it's about. And not, again, give the bogus situation. So I searched another, uh, but might have been another three, four months to find the scientists that might be doing this. Only to find that they've been stopped. And so the artwork helped create the science of hyperaccumulation. Okay, we have another question. Q&A moment. Soil, lead. 
Dirty business. Dirty business. Anyone? Anyone? Get dirty, dirty? Anyone? No? Going once? Going twice? Okay. I, I'll oh, we have two. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't write it down. This time. So when the plants take up lead, do the plants get affected? Again, no plants pick up lead. Uh, these scientists, uh, uh, they're allelopathy or allelochemicals, and it's the other. Uh, they they uh, evolve over a millennia in like serpentine soils that have heavy metals, and there's a capacity for it to pull up uh, metals. And maybe it toxifies the ground around it so other, other plants can compete. Uh, the, the book is Robert Richard Brooks' Biochemical Methods of Prospecting. Yeah, that was fundamental to the research that I was looking at that, uh, with Dr. Lewis Cheney. And the, the, it's interesting, it goes into the origins of understanding this. It's out of Africa with the copper flowers where uh, African smiths would look at certain plants and say, okay, we get, here we get copper. And those are indicator plants. Our hyperaccumulators were interesting from another level because if it can pull, pull enough heavy metal into its root shoots and leaves, you could harvest it at a degree where it can be mined for metal, which is very, extremely rare, by the way. So the employment of hyperaccumulators in the revival field was a, essentially a replicated field test to confirm science, because no one had ever tried it, you know in a field situation. So um, again, the research showed that there was no plants to pick up lead, but we were working with uh, zinc and cadmium, which is also a very highly toxic heavy metal. Hi, um, my question is about uh, working within, um, you know, compromised, whatever, working within under hegemony, working within a racist or white supremacist society, and the and the boundaries or the sort of process of questioning that you go through yourself when making a decision about something being too much of a compromise. I guess just the ethical considerations you make in terms of whether it's funding or partnerships, or you were talking earlier about accountability to community, which I do think is an ongoing concern in your work. Um, I'm just curious to hear about the process and the questions that you go through when making decisions about what type of work you want to do or not? First of all, my mother was from southern China, and uh, you don't hear no. She's, <laughs> she was the warrior woman. She taught me the will. And plus, I was raised in Texas. Um, there is a little bit of that, you know, the privacy hanging out. And I had to deal with it. And you deal with it, but I was... You know, I don't hear no, really. And that can be problematic. But you have to understand where the no comes from. And you have to turn it. And you have to respect that. I, mean, I think that it's not a compromise to hear a no and ch use that as the challenge. That no can come from that hegemony. It can come from this delusion of supremacy. It can come from many places. But you have to believe in concept to drive it into another conclusion. Because the, when you're approaching people about projects and the social, there are many assumptions that will come upon you. And it's up to you, your tenacity and your commitment and your self-critique of the project. I'm just talking about me, not about you, but you know. It has to be employed at full level. And it's also like to understand that it's just not what I believe or think, it's just like, you have to have a compassionate level or empathetic level. Um, in other words, so often the way of thinking about artists approaching society, trying to work on these big problems, is about subverting the system. And that's what we're taught. Uh, but I think the, the, the tougher thing that really sucks is called collaboration. It's even tougher. That means you're trying to elevate a system that is, in my opinion, approximation wrong. And so you have to work to get it, to spin it, and then physically or conceptually move it into 
maybe another place. And that collaboration takes a lot more effort. I, I, you know, as a follow-up to that question, because this is something I've been thinking about for a while, and we just had a um, symposium at the kitchen about on whiteness, and one of the um, papers given by Lauren Berlant was on likability, and, um, you know, she talks a little bit about what it means for artists of color to have to perform likability and also reassure white whiteness of its own likability in order to be able just to make work. And I'm even thinking about SOS, that piece over there where you interviewed people who 50% um, of them um, you know, believe that Donald Trump is doing a good job. And, um, and, and voted for him. So, so I, I'm also curious, in, because in your interaction with the public, and so much of the work is being made with the public, how do you um, think about your approach? Do you think about it as you approach people to engage in the making of these things? must. <laughs> I just can't put my finger on it. Of course, I, I think that maybe that I can see different projects that ultimately are, it's made, it must be made by the people, really. And, that, and it's, so therefore, it's almost inverting your creativity not to be about you, but how it eventually uh, is, is all dedicated for that to come about. It's almost to be made by people, but not everyone knows that. And it, and not even myself on how to do it. Well, how did you approach the people in SOS? Did you approach? Yeah. Well, that SOS was done um, during the Bush administration, uh, during the um, the uh, who was that guy? Yeah, the the, the, um, the Trump. I don't want to say. <laughs> okay. Oh, um, <laughs> it was it was tough. Yeah. Um, no, the way to approach is that would you like to speak to the president? You know, would you, and it's very direct, and uh, we want But did you it. come up with that as a kind of non judgmental, non. Did you think about how many versions of that question did you have before you got to that question? Well, the, the, the invention of SOS is not actually about the president, it's actually about the way documents are formed. Right. A document, you know, we, we, are, we frame our lives sometimes watching documentaries, whether it's Michael Moore or whoever it is. And it was a critique on the talking head. If the person is the most animated in any documentary, becomes the so-called star of the documentary. That's just the emotional uh, or just marketing weight of the document. And I wanted to subvert that. I, I, I was more interested in using the document, the documentary, as a um, as an egalitarian voice. Egalitarian voice is going to be if you want to make it democratic, you can't put anything. On it, and also how to give it um, the most powerful way is to give each individual voice that true individual structure, which is the heartbeat. So SOS straight off the street was intended to let people say whatever they wanted, be surprised and dismayed, of course, but be really cool. Um, when I first was engaged in the project, I just stayed quiet and let interviewers do the work, and I was the med tech. And that was the scariest thing, trying to take heartbeat. So the interviewers, who were they? Uh, there would be random, uh, random street, straight off the street, meant that we'd go to different neighborhoods and see someone, would you like to say something to the okay. president? Take that and not uh, let them say it, have them look at the camera quietly, capture that, take their heartbeat while they're thinking about and did you think about the race of the um, interviewer depending on the neighborhood that you were in? We tried not to. I, I think in this case, uh, I was in the middle of the thick of doing this exhibition, so uh, we had teams go out. Okay. Yeah. And um, tr we tried to have the interviewers to be uh, man, woman, can be different race, didn't matter. 
uh, just to say, we're, so the team idea with camera and the badges help. Mm -hmm. You gotta make your badges. Right. Like, you know, the facade of professionalism. <laughs> well, also to go back to your question, it, it's a way for the public to feel that you're authorized in some way, um, that you are within the bounds of white supremacy, in, inside the rules that have been made, yeah. and are readable in that sense. So, That's true. Um, but this leads us to translation. Um, and this is a quick question, there are many elements, and I think it connects with all of the sort of collaborative work you're doing. There are many elements of translation in your work in the way that you shift from disciplines, mediums, and also in the way concepts are translated throughout your ma imagination. I mean, for me, one of the, 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 the genius of you, um, and I don't know if you all have this um, reaction to Mel's work when you think, why didn't I think of that? You know, it's just like, it's so, sometimes it's so simple, and yet, um, so I wondered if you could speak about this act of reimagining through process. And um, here specifically, I'm thinking of the image of the daisy cutter bomb and our strange flower of democracy, but you know, really any of the works, like at what point in the, the process do you come to the, the moment? Because it seems like there is a definite process every single time. There is, I mean, you talk about strange flower, it's a long time process because uh, it comes from being like truly inspired, you know, um, by weird, strange places, you know. Uh, there was a film in the 60s, uh, I tell the story often, it was called Mondo Cani. It was an exploitation film by these two Italian producers that wanted to go around the world and film weird shit, you know, and put it out there. And one of the uh, parts was uh, Yves Klein, the famous French conceptualist, and how he would dip uh, nude women in blue paint and push them against the canvas. They captured that. And the rumor, I don't know, there was no internet, but back then there was a rumor that at the drive-in there might be a film with nudity. And I was like 10, or, uh, and man, you gonna say, I got to see that. <laughs> and so I, I was, and so I was so happy when my parents would take the whole family to a drive-in, and they would park the car and talk business, and they wouldn't watch the film, and all the kids be running around, you know, watching this stuff. Well, as time passes, um, I don't remember any of the scenes of Yves Klein, and you know that's a famous in art history. It, 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 when he saw it at the Cannes Film Festival, he had a heart attack and later died of a heart attack when he saw, because he thought the film was all going to be about him, and it wasn't, and, and it killed him, basically. But what I remembered was the cargo cult. I remember the cargo cult. I said, wow, these people, they make a whole plane out of bamboo, and they, they wait for the planes to return, whatever. I don't care what they do, but they, they made something out of bamboo. So, so you talk about that piece, the evolution starts maybe in the 60s with an exploitation movie and how it excited my imagination. And then you can think about, but then when you get older, much older, it's like, I still want to make something out of bamboo, but what the hell am I going to make? And then it comes back to horror, that we would be dropping leaflets with an image of this daisy cutter over Afghanistan that says, if you run, you'll live, if you stay, you will die. And I say, We're, if we thought we were there to promote democracy, why didn't we send, drop a paper with some kind of liberation ideology or something that we will support you if you move this way? No, we drop something that is, is intended to be anti-personnel and terror weapon. And then understand that bomb was dropped in Vietnam as a daisy cutter to cut down jungles, but obviously contributed to the 2.5 million Vietnamese that were butchered in the war. So understand that, that spectrum, you gotta make the peace. And it's to, 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 to say that this cargo is what our cargo is. The cargo called made those planes so the planes could come back 
So there are gifts that would come out of that to be shared within their community. And there's a, I think it's a high level of sophistication that was being maybe ridiculed by the film, but that is what those islanders believe because they're so isolated, you have to be generous to survive. And to me, that applies to the American ideology too. You better be generous about what's most precious to you. But instead, we drop that. So that's, a, that's why you gotta make the piece. So any questions about translation, process, art process, um, thinking about the making of your own pieces? I would assume some of you are artists. We have one. Hi. Um, so obviously some of your works take place in the community. Um, and some are more fitted for the gallery originally. But I'm wondering how you translate some of the works that are meant to be in the community and meant to live there uh, into a gallery space in a way that seems more than just documentation of the work. Mm. I'll leave it up to the curators. Not really. <laughs> I, I do feel that there is uh, I think it's more provocative rather to show the safe house door than, than talk about, you know, just my presence in the Orleans. Just show that, I, I think about the pieces that are in the community as more, that are in the exhibition as more like evidence. Presented like, you know, I, you know what do you call it, evidence? Uh, you, have, you have a little tag in there, uh, number one, number two, you know. Oh, exhibit? Exhibition, yeah, exhibit. yeah, yeah. yeah. Exhibit one, yeah, exhibit one. Uh, you know, or it was the case that they gave me. You know, here's exit one, exhibit one, you know, exhibit two. And um, it's funny when I'm making these things, I do think that uh, uh, working in a community, uh, no matter what it is, whether it's Flynn or it's in New Orleans, uh, really consider the practice of making something powerful that can be iconographic. It is in the consideration as, from the sculptural side, from the formal side, to not make it like light, to make it serious, to make it substantial. That, that that would be the first introduction to you sometimes when you're in those communities, you know. Um, it is also listening to people in the community. You know, when I was uh, working in Detroit after Devil's Night, coming with ideas, the people came to me um, and, and said something like, man, you know something? We really like your ideas, but you won't come in. And it's like, you're in that, say what? I'm here right now. I'll show you, I'll come back. And I did, until you run out of money. And they'll tell you, I told you so. Because people, they know already, people, uh, this world does not support what people who are poor. And if you want to work with people the poor, they won't support you forever. And they're right again. And it was shocking for me to be in New Orleans. For me, not so shocking was, was ready to be accepted when someone came up to me right by the safe house door and said, you're going now, right? And you're not coming back. And I had to say, you know, you're right. I may not come back, but I'm gonna work hardest as I can so something will to deal with what you're dealing with every day. And that will be my commitment. I'll do whatever I can. I, I think your question is another way of thinking about conceptual art as well, right? That um, these pieces become like signifiers to the community engagement that happened around the making of the piece. But there's no way, I mean, they're, they're stunning and well-crafted and made and but they, they cannot speak to the history before or the afterlife of those moments within the community. Um, so they do become like ex exhibit A or, or signifiers to, to a, a moment that was conceptual and community-based over and over and over again. 
And it's important to understand that the emotional weight that you feel working in, in these neighborhoods where every house has a shrine to some teenage kid who has been killed. Almost every mother, every grandmother has some history. I mean, almost at least every house I went into. And um, if you carry that sometimes, I feel like uh, if, you, if you're sensitive, it can, it can cause deep, deep depression. And I had to maintain almost a clinical approach, like just be like a doctor. I have to leave and go to DC now because that is my other side of it. Because that may be what will relieve the reality that you're living under. I have the liberty to go away, go the capacity. But I need to apply that in a very specific way so I can do the best, best for a, a climate that I share. You know, it's the climate of humanity that we're sharing. Okay, we have a few minutes. So our last category is sports. So important to you all, I know. Um, in case you weren't watching, Serena lost it at first sad day in my life. Sorry, okay. <laughs> um, I wanted to talk a little bit about impact and victory, partly because, um, as we know, LeBron James signed with, oh, what are they, the Lakers? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I know so much about sports. Um, and, um, and is moving back there. His family already has a house there. And so I was, I was really interested um, in that piece behind us. It, that's the... Um, that's it for the victory. That's for Michael Jordan. Oh, that's Michael Jordan. I but actually that, want to talk about that one. Yeah. Um, talk about both of them. Um, or, yeah, because they're linked. But that one started out with graffiti, right? Right. And right now there's a, a, a piece up, um, I don't know if you guys read about this, it was uh, of Mike, of um, LeBron, and then it got graffitied and they cleared the graffiti and then they put the graffiti back. So it's, it's sort of a continuation of, of this. So what role do sports play in your cultural imagination? And can you talk about both this piece and that piece? Well, I, I'm not too much a sport guy either, you know? But what I've found, it can be the unifier of conversation amongst people of any class and any race. So I have to respect that maybe it's a, a conversation that is important, dramatically important, or wouldn't have the sustained power it has in the, the minds of so many. So uh, when I, this project, called the Gate of the New Gods. The new gods are people like LeBron James, uh, who have such power over our imagination of capacity and money and fame, who, who earns it through some of the, the things he said. Uh, so when the gate was, his gate was attacked by racist graffiti, it really affected me more when he, you know, it was almost like you could expect that and which is tragic in its own sense, but his response was powerful, of saying, you know, no matter how far you are, and how great you are, and how much money you have, whatever, you, you know, this racism is something you're gonna have to deal with in America. It was like, we have to do this piece here. So that's the exact replica of this gate in LA, and we had, with the great lengths of getting the preparator from LA to get documentation and measure each brick and get the white paint and the, the measure to have it replicated. So I felt it could be a work of art that could be protected within the halls of a museum, not to be attacked ever again. So that's one thing. So that is not necessarily, it's about the power of sports and imagination, but what it has to contend with simultaneously. And the other the impotent victory is uh, Air Jordan's second year, I think maybe the first year, second year, uh, and it's not about Michael Jordan as much, but about marketing. And it was the, the victory, Nike, the victory uh, goddess, and Nike, at the time, they were talking about the economic miracle that is Nike. I was seeing it differently. I said, what's so economic miracle about putting all your marketing power to go to inner city neighborhoods and pump up your shoes and then go to Indonesia or China and then sew these, these suckers up. 
and then sell them back for the highest price you can and create the desire for these shoes within these kids, right? So I didn't think it was a miracle, so that's why I call it infant food. You know? It has a strange, oh, oh, we reselled it a little bit. You know, there's a book by Lauren Ballon called um, Cruel Optimism. And Cruel Optimism is the idea that we're encouraged to uh, attach to the things that ultimately will be our devastation. And so that um, becomes a moment like this. Um, so any questions? And this, we'll open out the questions now to any questions. Um, because we're moving towards the end of our time together. There's a question here. Uh, so two questions. The first is about sports. Uh, so I guess I, I'm thinking about how like the person, the people you're kind of celebrating with the piece back there are also the people who kind of participate in the market that's being criticized here. And also, I was thinking throughout the whole conversation about sports about how it kind of like, although they are deeply celebrated, they also kind of encourage this, you know, culture of toxic masculinity and a bunch of other problems. I guess, like, how do you reconcile like things being celebrated as well as, you know, the problems they create? Well, first of all, uh, one's about racism and yeah. one's about marketing. Uh, the, so it's not really, celebration of one or the other. So I try to make that point, why they're in proximity. It, and also, it's just speaking fact that uh, uh, the idea of gods might be suspect, but uh, it is what's being venerated. And, uh, and it's true, great capital is being imported into that. So yeah, the, 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 the point is, is to look at the situation where but one had a provocative statement to say in response to an attack world we live in, and one is largely silent as a personality. It is as he, uh, uh, Michael Jordan is very much about marketing, and but it may be the atmosphere that has been created uh, that allows even someone who's African American to be celebrated, and that's that's toxic. You know that you that you have to go through these great realms just to be treated like I am a person. You know, so this is what I think we're looking at, and why the, the commentary must be made by all of us to continue to critique the situation. I also think it's brilliant to have the Michael Jordan because Michael Jordan, throughout his career, has been criticized as somebody who has distanced himself from social issues and. Um, has been attached to the marketing, you know, and if he's, and the truth is if Michael Jordan's making money, then you can't imagine what um, Nike's making or other people whose products he promotes. But, and, and that piece, the, the LeBron um, Gates of the New Gods, I, I think, the idea that anti-black racism remains behind sports is also, to me, a compelling argument, no matter if you're looking at marketing or you're looking at racism. I mean, you know, it is tied to, as we saw with the kneeling, with the, the owners talking about, what was that phrase they used? We can't let the inmates run the prison um, about sports people who, you know, clearly are considered gods within the culture. Um, thank you, Claudia. Thank you, Mel. I have a question about, I, I would just love to hear what uh, Mel meant by unauthorized collaborations. What that means. You mean those paintings that could start setting up? On the phrase. Um, on the phrase. I have it in front of my notes. Um, earlier on, you said that. Um, yeah, okay. No, oh, I, in New Orleans. It was when you were talking about New Orleans. I don't think it was about paintings. Well, I, I think what I mean is that uh, 
you know, sometimes uh, things that are made that have authorship are tossed away. They're discarded. They, they lose their family. But I still have to understand they come from a certain source. And then uh, the collaboration to bring art into the picture, or the practice of art to the picture. So you collaborate with something that may be out of, lost its connection. And, but I still want to attribute where it comes from. The, um, the portraits that are back there, is that over that way, um, or that way? <laughs> <laughs> and that way too. And that way. So that, that, that sense that now you have this piece of art and you're collaborating with the thing, mm -hmm. but the, the, the origin of the, the who owns it, what, what's the word for that in art? Um, a, se a session of it? You know what I'm talking about? The, the, the provenance is missing. Yeah, well, you know, also paintings and portraits and things have aura. You know, they represent people or families, and and it's it's once they're discarded from that from the museum or from a family home, uh, they're 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 out, and they, but they still have the aura. So, you know, what the hell are you cutting them up for? You know, so to me, it's almost like they're dead. They died. And maybe perhaps the cut is more like a surgical kind of relationship to revive it in contemporary, and I could, to give it another message that it may have, would have, uh, that's buried in that. To, to my favorite statement that you isolate from James Baldwin. Oh, <laughs> it's, not the, it's not the answers, but the questions right. that we yeah. need. But also, I, I feel like the funk and wag also is a kind of intervention into an, um, an, a, a, another unauthorized collaborative. Yeah, 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 you're not supposed to mess with books. No. You know, though you throw them away, you know? And I said, well, what the hell? It, 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 well, that's, that's just addiction. You start cutting up books, pretty soon you'll be cutting up paintings, you cut up, you know, <laughs> you cut up everything, but you gotta glue it. See, that's the trick. <laughs> You just can't cut shit up. You gotta glue it back together, right? That's the hardest part. Where to glue it, how to glue it. Uh, that takes a lot of concentration. Any other questions? Oh, we have one final. Of course, I always go back to water. Um, so we all know about what an oasis is in the desert place that has water and species of all diversity come there together and drink water. Do they fight there? I don't know. I have to go look that up. But I had been thinking about how to design a university where you attract students of all different disciplines to exchange knowledge and ideas and like an oasis. So when you make your, or curate your program for an art exhibit, are you thinking about an oasis? Well, you know, I, uh, I'm not a curator. <laughs> so it's interesting that you asked that. Um, and the, the places where I think it's not oasis, but at one time it was Detroit. It was Detroit. like Detroit, I, 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 because I was looking at, back then, that's the oasis. Because the pot potentiality for interaction with thinkers and, and neighborhoods was a way of teaching other cities how to re become revived. It's not so, the oasis is, is, is places of deep contradiction and conflict are the places I gravitate to. Now, I don't track down disaster to make art, but it seems the most obvious what was happening in, uh, when I was in Ann Arbor, it's fancy, University of Michigan, School of Humanities, and then they have independent like expeditions to Detroit. I said, I was trying to come up with something called uh, SWIG, Sustainable Works Involving Neighborhood Groups, and it would be a multi-discipline 
uh, group. I talked to School of Engineering, School of Law, School of Art. They got them all on board the deans to say, why don't you start the new grad school of interactions, but the factor that's most important is you go into a place in Detroit. And don't even think about the economic level. Maybe the people need an accounting office in, you know, Gross Point, whatever. But to, to be challenged by, to have the grad students be challenged in a multidisciplinary way to solve a problem. And the thing about the sustainability would be the school would have to, if they didn't work out one semester, the next one could follow up and not drop the ball until you feel, figure it out for that neighborhood. It, it, yeah, it, it, I worked years on that project, um, of course, and with the city of Detroit until Kwame got you know, sent away. I mean, his people were involved with this. You know, and so it's a postulation. And I don't think it's always going to the most beautific spot. It is the, it, sometimes the places that we shy away from have the most potential for elevating us, you know? And that, I think that that's something I still believe in, you know? Thank you so much, Mel. That was necessary because the work does each piece, each individual piece, lives inside the community that it arose from. And thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, round. Wow.